back in section 2.6, we had a theorem, theorem 2.6.3, called the invertible matrix theorem. And that theorem said that if we have a square matrix, we'll call it A, then the following statements are equivalent. As a reminder, all that means is that if you know one of these statements, you know all the other six. If one is true, they're all true. A is invertible. A is row equivalent to the n by n identity matrix. We call that I sub n. And A has n pivot positions. That means you can put it into echelon form, reduced echelon form. The equation AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. N by N matrices C and D exist such that you can multiply A from either side by some matrix. Some, some matrix exists. That uh, means that you can multiply A by either side by some particular matrix and get the identity, identity matrix. That's five and six. And number seven, A transpose. The transpose matrix, the matrix formed by transposing A, that matrix is also invertible. Now it's important to remember that what does, this does not necessarily say is that if A is an n by n by n matrix, that A is automatically invertible. It just says that if A is an n by n matrix and A is invertible, then all these other statements are true. If A is an n by n matrix and you know that the matrix A only has a trivial solution, you know this fact, then you also know that the transpose of A is invertible and that A is row equivalent to I sub n and so on. It does not say that A is, a is an n by n matrix automatically means any of these things. That's important, uh, an important dist distinction to, to make. There's no if statement here. If A is an n by n matrix, that, that, does, not ex that does not say that. Okay? So that's an important thing to, to keep in mind as we go forward. Then in section 3.4, we added a number eight to this list. The determinant of A is non-zero. So if you know A has N pivot positions, if you put it into echelon form, for example, and you can see that it's, uh, it's got N pivot positions, then you also will know that its determinant is non-zero. If you know that uh, A is invertible, for example, then you can say that uh, its determinant is going to be non-zero. If you know that its determinant is non-zero, this is kind of powerful. If you take the determinant of a matrix, a square matrix, and it's not zero, then you know all of these other things. So this is a pretty powerful addition. In the next section, in the, in the section that we're in right now, in section 5.5, we're gonna add one more line to this. Your book does not do this by adding a, a, an item nine to the list. It, it does it this way. It, it just states in theorem 5.5.1, the invertible matrix theorem, which is the, the same thing as we're working with here, it states by itself that an n by n matrix A is invertible if and only if lambda equals zero is not an eigenvalue. But we can turn this statement around a little bit and, and use it to add to, uh, add to this list of, of equivalent statements. We can, we can make this a number nine here. Notice that each of these things is equivalent. In other words, if I know one of them, I know all the others. And what I'm saying here is that an n by n matrix A is invertible if something else is true, or this fact over here is true if A is invertible. A is an invertible matrix. Up here, we said A is an n by n matrix, so we've satisfied this criterion here. A is an n by n matrix. Then it's true for an n by n matrix that if that matrix is invertible, all of these other statements are true. In fact, this is a new statement we can add to that list. So I'm going to say that if A is an n by n matrix, then it's true that if A is invertible, lambda equals zero is not an eigenvalue. Oops, it is not an eigenvalue. And this if and only if statement, I've abbreviated it here because just like my, my usual, I'm out of room for anything longer than that. Um, that means that I have, to, I, can, I can say, well, I can either say that A is an N by N matrix and N by N matrix A is invertible as long as if 
this uh, my lambda is not an eigenvalue, right? Lambda equals zero is not an eigenvalue. This specific value. I also can say that if I if I find all the eigenvalues of a matrix A, and lambda is not one of them, then in this other direction, I can also say, well, in that case, that that matrix matrix must be invertible. So in a roundabout way here, I'm saying that for some n by n matrix, if it is invertible, lambda equals zero is not, not an eigenvalue. And if lambda equals zero is not an eigenvalue, this statement is true, then so is this. And so if I can say that this statement implies this statement, and this statement also means all these others are true, then this statement implies this statement, which means this has to be equivalent to all the others. So we've just added a line nine, even though that's not quite how your textbook did it. So I'm gonna erase this version. And so now what we have is a, an updated version, uh, updated again, version of the invertible matrix theorem. Now it's taken me six minutes basically to add one line to this theorem that we already know, but it's nice and compact. Um, so I'm not ap gonna apologize for having done it that way. This is all stuff that we already know and we've added another another very powerful uh, little tool to it. On the next slide, I'm gonna sh uh, talk about some other theorems that are related to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Your textbook sort of lumps all of these various different theorems into one theorem 5.5.2 and we're going to treat this much the way your textbook does which is to say that uh, I want you to have some exposure to these ideas but I'm not going to ask you to prove any of them and in fact I don't think I'm probably going to take the time to prove any of them either. There's the proof of the third one in your textbook uh, actually and number five is also proved for you in your textbook um, if I have time, I'll go back and make another video at some point um, that proves the other theorems. But there, the textbook is using, it's calling it theorem 5.5.5, 5.5.2. It's lump, but it's lumping them all. It's five different theorems and it's lumping them all into one theorem. So we're making five statements here, each of which really kind of deserves its own, its own name or at least its own number um, in your textbook just isn't doing that. So let's just write them down, have a quick look at what they are saying, and then we'll just use them going forward. We won't actually take the time to prove them. We start again with the statement, let A be an N by N matrix. So the five statements that I'm about to discuss here all rely on the fact that uh, the matrix that we're gonna be talking about is called A, so we can talk about A. We, we, we can write A and know that what we're referring to is a matrix and that A is an N by N matrix. That means it's square. And I could just say let A be a square matrix. But if I need to refer to the dimensions of A at all in any of the statements that I'm about to write, then it, it's helpful to have said that those dimensions are N by N. If I've already said that, then I don't need to worry about defining it as I go along. Our first theorem is uh, if A is an N by N matrix, then A has at most n distinct eigenvalues. So as you can see here, I'm referring to uh, n as, a, as an important feature of the matrix that I'm working with. And so it's important to have stated up here that A is the n by n matrix. If A is n by n, then this n has some meaning. If I don't say that up here, then this n has to be defined here. So uh, this first statement is that A has at most n distinct eigenvalues. So if A is some n by n square matrix, then it's true that A has at most n distinct eigenvalues. If you take all of the, uh, find all of the eigenvalues of A, some square matrix uh, with, with dimensions n, n by n, then there aren't going to be any more than n of those. There are only going to be up to n eigenvalues. There might be fewer, and in fact, there might be duplicates. And that's why the word distinct is so important here. Uh, we could have, if, if n is, say, 5, then it's theoretically possible that we could have six eigenvalues, but two of them would then necessarily be the same number. So that's what we mean by distinct. So if A is an n by n matrix, number 2, and if A has distinct n distinct eigenvalues, if it has n different eigenvalues, then we can compute the determinant of A just by multiplying those eigenvalues together, the distinct ones. So if you have two twos 
as two of your eigenvalues, then you're only going to use one of those twos in the product. Right? We're talking about the n distinct eigenvalues. Um, multiplying those together gives you uh, a product, and that product is equal to the determinant. Now, in this case, um, we're saying that A has n distinct eigenvalues um, as, a, as a requirement. Right? We can't do this unless we start with the fact that a has n distinct eigenvalues. Well, A is an n by n matrix we set up here. So that means that n has exactly, sorry, A has exactly n different eigenvalues, so there will be no duplicates, right? So this is a requirement for this theorem. Uh, a has to have n distinct eigenvalues for, for us to be able to do this. But if it does, then you just multiply those together and you get the determinant of A. Number three says that if the k eigenvalues of A are distinct, in other words, if all of the eigenvalues that you find are different, and there might be n of them, or there might be fewer than n of them, right? If A is an n by n matrix, then we already know that A has at most n distinct eigenvalues. There can't be more than n, but there might be fewer. So if there are k, and k might be n, um, if there are k eigenvalues of A and they're all different, then the eigenvectors that, that are associated with each of those, there'll be k, k eigenvectors as well, those eigenvectors will be linearly independent. It's kind of hard to explain this one, but this is the one that's proved for you um, in the textbook. And I, I'm not gonna talk about it a, a whole lot. It's a fairly complex proof, um, but the, the crux of it is just so that you can, I want to be able to say we've talked about this type of proof. Um, what they've done is they've started with a statement uh, that seems contradictory to what they want to show. They want to show that uh, the, the eigenvectors of some matrix A are independent, linearly independent, and they start with a, supp a supposition, an assumption, that those K eigenvectors are not independent, that they're dependent, right? Then they go on to show that if that's the case, then one of the eigenvalues, sorry, one of the eigenvectors that you end up with is the zero vector. But that can't be the case because by definition, the zero vector is not an eigenvector. So by contradiction, the original statement cannot be true. And therefore, the eigenvectors v1 through vk are linearly independent. So this is called a proof by contradiction. It's a bit more involved than I would necessarily expect you to be able to, um, I don't know, I would definitely not expect you to be able to, to produce a proof like this at this point, uh, but it would, it would definitely be worth going through it and, and reading to make sure you can follow it. It's tricky, so don't be too hard on yourself if you can't quite follow it. Um, but this is the kind of thing that, you know, depending on what you're um, what your future holds for you, certainly math majors would be expected to be able to follow this kind of proof and potentially eventually be able to produce something like it as well later on in, in your careers. That's enough for us, though. If you have uh, some eigenvalues for a square matrix A and all of those eigenvalues are distinct, then the eigenvectors that go with them will be linearly independent. Now notice that this one does not go the other way. If you have k linearly independent eigenvectors, that does not necessarily mean you're going to have k eigenvalues that are distinct. It's an if-then statement, not an if-and-only-if statement. So this one's a little bit different. Theorem number four says that if the vector x is an eigenvector of a that corresponds to some eigenvalue lambda, so we're just being generic here, some eigenvector x and some eigenvalue lambda. If x is the eigenvector that goes with lambda, right, these two things, that's the eigenpair, then a multiple of the vector x is also an eigenvector of a for all k not equal to zero. Now k is just a scalar. Remember that an eigenvector is a vector that you multiply a matrix by. So if you have a matrix A and you multiply it on the right by the vector x, then you're going to get the same thing as if you multiplied it by lambda. So lambda is a scalar and k, sorry, x is an eigenvector that goes with lambda, but, but that vector is just, uh, it has direction and it has magnitude, right? 
some of its magnitude comes from lambda. That's the eigenvalue. That's the scalar that we can pull out of it, as it were. Um, some other scalar on the same eigenvector is going to push that vector for a different distance, but in the same direction. So that means that if x is an eigenvector, then any multiple of x is also an eigenvector. Now, this notation here, um, I, I did this on purpose because it's not one that we've seen before, but I wanted you to see it. It's an upside down capital A, or at least that's how it's formed. And it just means for all or for every. So that symbol is equivalent to say saying for every whatever, right? And in this case, I'm saying for every k that's not zero. So any value of k as long as it's not zero. Okay, our last statement, our last theorem here is that if A is an upper or lower triangular matrix, then the eigenvalues of A are just the diagonal entries. Now that one's pretty powerful because if you have a matrix in the form, let's just go one, zero, oh gosh, uh, zero, two, I need a three by three here. Well, this one's in upper triangular form. It's a very simple one. Let's make a three by three. Right, there we go. There is a three by three matrix. So that's my matrix A, which is an N by N matrix where N is three. It's true for this matrix that A has at most N distinct eigenvalues, the most, the largest number of eigenvalues that I'll be able to find for this matrix is three. Uh, let's see, if there are three of them and they're all different, then I'll be able to, to find the determinant of A just by multiplying those eigenvalues together. That's uh, statement number two. Number three, however many there are, as long as they're all distinct, then the corresponding eigenvectors will be in linearly independent. Once I find one eigenvector of A that co corresponds to one of my eigenvalues, then I can take any multiple of that uh, vector, and that's gonna be a mul an, an eigenvector of this matrix as well. And number five here, what this one is saying, is that if A is an upper or lower, lower triangular matrix, this one's upper triangular because everything down here is a zero, but not everything up here is a zero. So this is an upper triangular matrix. Then the eigenvalues of A are just the diagonal entries. So one, two, and seven. Now it has to be in this form for that to be the case, but if you get a matrix that's in this form, you can just look at it and say, oh, I know those are my, I know those are my eigenvalues. The proof of this, this theorem, this statement is really kind of interesting and I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, but I do wanna sort of jump on a couple of things. One is some vocabulary, this without loss of generality statement, the statement that the proof starts with. Um, we're talking here about either an upper or a lower triangular matrix, right? And the proof only does it for only, the proof only discusses an upper triangular matrix. So what, when it says without loss of general, generality, um, assume it's an upper triangular matrix and what it's not saying but is implied there is this will also work for a lower triangular matrix. So that's what that without loss of generality statement sort of means. Now the thing that's cool about this one is we already know some some factoids about um, upper triangular matrices, right? We know how to find the determinant of a triangular matrix. It's the product of the diagonals. Well, if you go back up here to statement two, if A has N distinct eigenvalues, then the determinant of A is equal to the product of, eigen, of the eigenvalues. Now, this is not a bi-directional statement. A has to have A distinct eigenvalues to start with, but it's an interesting correlation, right? If this is an upper triangular matrix, which it is, then the determinant will be, now just the determinant, right? I'm not talking about eigenvalues now. The determinant will be the product of the three diagonal entry. So the determinant here is going to be 14. Let's make a note of that. The determinant of A is 14. And then down here in statement 5, we say if A is an upper or lower triangular matrix, then the eigenvalues are the diagonal entries. Right? The eigenvalues are the diagonal entries. And up here we say the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues but we know the determinant is the product of the diagonal entries, right? So there's sort of a circular argument going on between these two statements and the statement we, we know from earlier about just using the diagonals of a triangular matrix to find the determinant. So I, I haven't proved anything here. I haven't actually even drawn a, 
a solid conclusion, but I think it, it's an interesting correlation to observe. So that's our last of the five here. If A is a triangular matrix, then you can find its eigenvalues just by taking the diagonal entries. Just a quick statement here at the end of this video uh, to point out there is not going to be a video for the last uh, subsection in this textbook, in this, in this section. It's called Eigenvalues and Eigenvectors of Linear Transformations, and we have not discussed linear transformations. So I'm not going to be uh, lecturing on that subsection here, and I'm not going to ask you to read that subsection here. So for this section of the textbook, 5.5, we are finished. There is no, uh, there's no video for the last topic.